Okay, in this example, we're told we have a pitot tube, uh, which is used to measure the speed of air. And at low speeds, we can reasonably treat the air as being an incompressible fluid. However, at high speeds, this assumption is not very good due to compressibility effects. And we're asked to find at what Mach number does the incompressibility assumption become inaccurate and justify our us answer with appropriate calculations. So the picture we're dealing with here is this. We've got some incoming flow. We'll call this uh, the conditions up here um, V infinity for velocity, P infinity for pressure, T infinity, rho infinity. These are, uh, you know, pressure, temperature, and density. All the conditions far upstream. That's what we want to measure. And then here's the pitot tube that we'll use to measure the pressure. Okay, and uh, this will have some height difference here like this. And right at this point on the tube, this is actually a stagnation tube that I've drawn here, but you can imagine, you know, it's stagnation conditions here and then ambient or static conditions out here. A pitot tube measures the difference between these two. The, the, it basically has a, measures the pressure, dif pressure differential between these two points. Um, but I'm just drawing a quick uh, stagnation tube kind of picture. Anyway, at, at that location that I've drawn here, the velocity will be zero. That, that'll be stagnation conditions, so we'll use the subscript zero for stagnation conditions. It'll be the stagnation pressure, stagnation temperature, stagnation density, etc. And the velocity, of course, is zero. So let's first of all work the problem assuming that we're dealing with an incompressible fluid. So we're going to do this incompressible case, and then we'll do it assuming that there is compressibility, and we'll compare the two answers. So if it's incompressible, we can use Bernoulli's equation to determine the velocity from the pressure difference. So I'm just doing Bernoulli's equation from a point far upstream here to that stagnation point. So the conditions upstream up here, there's our Bernoulli's equation. I'm not including the elevation differences because we're dealing with air here. And at stagnation conditions, the velocity there is zero, so that's why I don't have that. So our velocity that we would measure, assuming that the flow is incompressible, would look like the following. It would be uh, P naught minus P infinity divided by rho. This would be the rho infinity, and then multiply by 2 in the numerator there. I should have probably put rho infinity there since that's the density far upstream. We're assuming that the flow in this case is actually incompressible. So that would be the velocity we would um, expect if we assume that we were dealing with an incompressible flow. So we would measure the pressure difference using the, the height difference in the manometer, for example. And so, so this pressure difference can be related to that height. And then once we have that, we can calculate then the velocity. So now let's do the same thing, but assuming that we have some compressibility to our flow. And uh, we'll assume that it's, uh, the, the, the flow comes to rest from the uh, far upstream conditions to stagnation conditions. We'll assume that this process is isentropic, that the flow comes to rest isentropically to the, um, to the stagnation port there. So the way we'll get started there is we'll say that the difference between the stagnation pressure and the pressure far upstream looks like the following. Let me just write this out, and you'll see it's just a little bit of algebra here. So I just took that pressure difference. It's kind of like the pressure difference here. You know, this is what we would measure in the manometer up here. The, the p naught would be the measurement here, so this would be what, what p naught is, and this would be the p infinity measurement here. And that we just rewrote that so it has this ratio. And the reason I wanted to do that ratio is because we have a, an isentropic expression for that ratio, the P naught over P infinity. So P naught over P infinity is related to the Mach number from our isentropic relations. So it's looks like this from the isentropic relations. K here is our specific heat ratio. This is the Mach number out at uh, far upstream. And then uh, we can substitute, of course, we can substitute this expression right into there. Let's do that. The other thing I'm going to do when I do that is I'm, I'm going to uh, change the, I'm going to multiply by a dynamic pressure up front here and divide by a dynamic pressure. 
And the reason I want to do that is because I'm going to end up using the ideal gas law. You'll, you'll see this in the um, algebra in just a moment here. So let me just rewrite that expression. At this point, there's just a lot of algebra involved and some substitutions. So we're writing this out. So this, you can see this 1 half rho v squared and this 1 half rho v squared cancel out to give you the p infinity, so that's that term. And then I'll go ahead and substitute in with our isentropic stagnation pressure ratio. Okay, so we're at this point. And uh, part of the reason I wanted to do this was because I can rewrite this expression now making use of the ideal gas law. So let me just do that. P infinity over 1 half rho infinity V infinity squared. That can be written using the ideal gas law as R, the gas constant for air, times T infinity. That, that is the P infinity over rho infinity. So let's do that. So we're at this point. And then what I'll do is I'll um, multiply by the um, specific heat ratio in the numerator and the denominator. Okay, so here we are at this point. And uh, you know what, let me just put the 2 up in the numerator there just for simplicity. So we, got, we have that. Now if you look in the numerator here, this is the speed of sound. So let's go ahead and write that out. So this will be 2 times the speed of sound far upstream. We have k times v infinity squared in the denominator. And you'll see that one, the c infinity over one of the v infinities, that's like a Mach number. So this will be like 2 over k times, oh, I'm sorry, that, I, I made a mistake here. This krt infinity, that's actually speed of sound squared. I should have put the squared here. And so then what you see is that this ratio, let me highlight that, that ratio is like 1 over the Mach number squared. So you can see then that this expression here, the p infinity over the dynamic pressure, is related to the Mach number. So we can substitute that in right up in there. Okay, so let me go ahead and do that and then write it out. Now we just have to write a bunch of stuff out here. It gets a little busy. Um, I think I may have made a mistake somewhere here. Yeah, when I when I up, come up here and look at that, that shouldn't be k over 1 minus k. It should be k over k minus 1. I apologize for that. I just realized that. And so this one should also be k over k minus 1. I've gotten into the habit of writing p over p naught, and so that's why I flipped that around by mistake. Okay, so we're at this point, and now what I want to do is solve for the V infinity. So I can do some rearranging. And so V infinity for the compressible flow, namely isentropic flow, assuming that we're dealing with an ideal gas, will look like the following. So again, just a lot to write out. So I apologize, I'm going slowly here, but I just want to make sure I don't write something incorrectly. Okay, I think I got it right there. Oh, and there's a square root that goes over the whole thing. Let me just double check that I've written all that correctly before moving on. Okay, I think I got it all right there. So 
you can see that when we're dealing with a compressible flow, it's a much more complicated relationship. We would still measure the P0 minus P infinity. That, that still comes from the manometer. Rho infinity is the density far upstream. Mach number infinity is the Mach number far upstream. And of course, K is the specific heat ratio. So you can see when we're dealing with a compressible flow, the velocity calculation is more complicated than if it was incompressible. But ultimately, the question we were asked to find was what's the... Um, What's the difference? You know, what um, when when does assuming incompressible flow become a poor assumption? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the difference between these. I'll just take the let me let me write this down down here. Uh, give me just a moment here. Or actually, I think I, I've got it already written out. So let me just do that instead. Okay, so. Yeah, here's what I've done is I've written down the relative error between the two is the, the velocity assuming an isentropic flow, compressible flow. This is the more correct assumption, right? In reality, there's always some compressibility to the air. It's not truly incompressible. The incompressible uh, assumption is an approximation. So this is the, the more correct answer is assuming it's always isentropic. Here is our approximation, assuming it's incompressible, and then we're going to divide through by the real result. So this is kind of the difference between the, the, the better model versus the less accurate model divided through by the better model. And so that, that, that'll be our relative error. And so if I take that V infinity from the um, ideal gas derivation that we, or the isentropic derivation we did just a moment ago, substitute in the incompressible expression from Bernoulli's equation, divide through and go through that algebra, you get this kind of expression. And we can go ahead and plot that. And by the way, when I wrote this out, the, the gamma here is just the K. Uh, in, in some areas of compressible flow, or also known as gas dynamics, they use a gamma instead of a K for the specific heat ratio. So I apologize that it's uh, switched here. Anyway, if we plot that out for air, for um, the specific heat ratio equal to 1.4, as a function of Mach number, you see this kind of a plot. And if uh, we say that what's acceptable is a 1% error, then you can see from the plot here, that corresponds to pretty close to about 0.3, Mach number of 0.3. So when our Mach number is less than about 0.3, then using the incompressible assumption, which would be like over here, so this, the incompressible assumption is okay because the errors will be less than 1%. But over here, the incompressible sh assumption sh gives us uh, more error, you know, greater than 1% error. Now, why 1%? Well, it's just a nice number. It's like we had the 99% boundary layer thickness. You know, 1% is, is just a nice number. You don't have to stick with 1%, but that's just the convention is to use 1% as the threshold here. Now you'll notice that the Mach number of 0.3 being the threshold, this is something we've talked about at the very beginning of the course where we said that if uh, you're dealing with flows where the Mach number or is less than 0.3 or the, the flow speed is less than about a third of the speed of sound, then you can assume that the flow is incompressible. And that comes directly from this plot. When your Mach number is greater than about a third the speed of sound, or I'm sorry, when your Mach number is greater than about 0.3, then you have to it's better to assume that the flow is compressible and take into account compressibility effects. So anyway, that's where that rule of thumb comes from, is from this kind of analysis. All right, well, hopefully this makes sense to you. Really, that it's, it's more of a complicated um, algebra problem more than anything else. Hopefully, using Bernoulli's equation, the incompressible form of Bernoulli's equation here to get that V infinity was straightforward for you. Doing the analysis for this part is more of just kind of knowing what pieces to substitute in where. Probably the hardest little bit is just knowing this. The, the way I knew to do this kind of derivation here is because I wanted to put things in terms of the Mach number. And so this is a, a way to do that. But that, that's probably the hardest part of the problem.